In 2016, Treasury Secretary Jacob Liu announced the decision to update the $20 bill, replacing the portrait of the seventh US President Andrew Jackson with the portrait of Harriet Tubman, a black human rights defender, suffragist and abolitionist. In 2017, Liu's successor Steven Mnuchin postponed the introduction of the new bill design, allegedly for technical reasons. It remains unknown whether such was the wish of the eccentric US President Donald Trump, but one thing is known for sure, Harriet Tubman's contribution to American society is truly remarkable. In this episode of How It Was, we will tell you how this secret path system came into being and worked. You will find out why the Underground Railroad had no railway tracks at all, who was financing it and who the conductors and stockholders were. And finally, how, despite strong opposition from politicians and slave owners, the Underground Railroad conveyed 100,000 people to the north of the United States. But first, subscribe to our channel to stay up to date with the new releases. On an August day in 1619, the British pirate ship White Lion anchored at the coast of future state of Virginia. They brought more than 20 African captives, according to the surviving documents. The pirates captured them from Portuguese slave traders and made a profitable exchange in the colony. The English crown then had just begun to reclaim new lands in North America, and the settlers were happy to receive free labor. This is how the history of American slavery began. However, in those days, slavery in the American colonies of England wasn't yet institutionalized. Over the next century, it was gradually forming, growing stronger, and was finally officially legalized at the beginning of the 18th century. The Thirteen Colonies War of Independence, which ended in 1783, not only freed the citizens of the newly formed United States from the metropolis, but also launched the process of abolishing slavery, which would later lead to a split in the southern and northern states. In the first decades after the war measures were taken throughout the country to eradicate slavery, in the northern states it was abolished and in the south slave owners were massively releasing slaves. It seemed that the days of this barbaric practice were numbered. However, this trend ceased in the southern states with the Industrial Revolution and the global cotton boom of the early 19th century. Besides, the territorial expansion of the United States in the first half of the 19th century did little good for the abolition of slavery. The new lands required cheap, or better still, free labor. The life of slaves was, with rare exceptions, an incessant train of humiliations. Their only salvation was an escape to the free states and the promised land. That is how the British territories of North America, future Canada, were called among the slaves. In the civilized northern states, there were many people sympathetic to slaves who supported the idea of the abolition of slavery, especially among white radical Protestants and free African Americans. Their joint efforts helped transform the slaves' isolated experiences of escape into an organized system of secret paths known as the Underground Railroad. What was the Underground Railroad and how did it operate? Technically, the Underground Railroad has never been either underground or railroad. The railway terminology was a tribute to the times. Besides, there was an element of creating a legend, a deliberate disguising the reality. In fact, there was no railroad. The fugitives used secret routes along which they moved at night, accompanied by a conductor, who was a former fugitive or a volunteer who knew the area. Traveling 15 to 30 kilometers at night, the group arrived to a station, which was a place they could rest during the day. Usually, it was a home of sympathetic people, sometimes natural shelters. The conductors worked in tandem with the station keepers, people who assisted the escape. There were also the railroad stockholders, wealthy abolitionists or free people from the northern states who financially supported the escapes. Since a slave in the southern states was considered not a person but property, and escape was a theft, this was a very risky activity that threatened punishment for all participants. Southerners not only asked federal agencies to search for fugitive slaves, but also hired so-called slave catchers, private individuals, engaged in catching fugitives. Besides, the slave-owning lobby in Congress promoted the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which allowed to return fugitive slaves even from the free states. It is worth mentioning here, the so-called Reverse Underground Railroad, a system created by slave owners to capture and transport African Americans to the South, used against both fugitive slaves and free blacks who were kidnapped for sale. However, 
Despite the active opposition of southern tycoons and politicians, the threat of legal responsibility and the absence of a powerful political lobby, by 1850 the Underground Railroad had successfully transported to the north, according to some estimates, about 100,000 people. Of course, compared to the total number of slaves, which on the brink of the Civil War was about 4 million, with a total population of 31 million, even 100,000 is a small figure. But even this was enough to gradually influence public opinion of the northern states about the slave-owning South. The Underground Railway didn't have any control centre. Most participants of an escape performed their limited role in the operation without knowing all its links, and only the conductor led the group of escapees from hell to the promised land. Here, we return to Harriet Tubman, the legendary figure of American abolitionism and a highly effective conductor as well. She emphasized that she never lost a single passenger. Mother Tubman was a representative of the so-called house Negroes. This expression describes slaves who worked in a master's house and could expect less severe working conditions and a slightly more humane attitude. However, as an adolescent, Harriet suffered a head injury. An overseer threw a heavy object at another slave, but it hit her. Over time, she received more and more tasks outdoors and her status changed to a field negro, that is, the one who had to work on the plantation. In 1849, at the age of 27, Tubman escaped and settled in Philadelphia. But the thought that her parents and brothers remained in slavery haunted her, and she brought them out as well. Then another group, and another one. Soon she was called Moses, after the biblical character who brought his people out of slavery. In the 1850s, rescuing slaves became even more dangerous, since moving to a free state no longer guaranteed to gain freedom. The Fugitive Slave Act, which we mentioned earlier, not only allowed to return fugitives from their territory, but also compelled citizens to assist in the capture. However, this didn't stop Tubman. Over the course of 11 years, she made 13 trips and rescued about 70 people and inspired even more people to escape. In addition to the former slaves who had experienced the overseer's whip themselves, quite successful white people, driven by humanistic ideals and belief in equality, were also involved in rescuing fugitives. Among them was Levi Coffin, a farmer and businessman, a prominent member of the Quaker religious community, who supplied the fugitives with clothing, food and shelter. This man who helped thousands of slaves to freedom was known as the President of the Underground Railroad, and his home was called the Grand Central Station of the Underground Railroad. Once, when Levi was seven, he saw a man in chains and asked why he was chained. He remembered the answer for the rest of his life so that I can't run away to my wife and children. This incident greatly influenced Coffin, whose home had become a constant shelter for escaped slaves. He was threatened by slave owners, slavery supporters boycotted his business, and later, due to the increasing persecution of the abolitionist Quaker church in the slave-owning states, Levy was even forced to move from his native North Carolina. However, his humanitarian activity only expanded. Moreover, Coffin helped the former slaves to settle after the escape. For instance, in just a year after the war, he collected more than $100,000, about $1,600,000 in today's money, for the Western Freedmen's Aid Society. Perhaps it was Levi Coffin and his wife Catherine who became the prototypes of the abolitionist family who sheltered the heroine of Uncle Tom's Cabin. What about the geography of the escapes? The Underground Railroad network covered several states. It began at the northern border of slave-owning Missouri, almost in the center of today's United States, and went to the east coast through the borders of Kentucky, Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware, where slavery was also legal. The Ohio River, which separated the slave-owning Kentucky and Virginia from the free Indiana and Ohio, became known as the River Jordan among the escaped slaves by analogy with the river, crossing which meant finding the Promised Land, a new homeland for the ancient Israelites. The operation of the Underground Railroad ended with the Civil War, partly fought over the issue of slavery. Then, in May 1861, a month after the outbreak of hostilities, three slaves from the South fled to Fort Monroe, a military fortress in the port of Hampton controlled by the Northern Army. 
To keep the fugitives, Commander Benjamin Franklin Butler declared them contraband of war. On the one hand, it was inhumane, but at the same time, it allowed them not to hand them over to the Southerners. With the onset of open conflicts between the northern and southern states, fugitive slaves could no longer fear the federal marshals and bounty hunters who, in pre-war times, could legally scour the free states in search of fugitives. The only issue now was leaving the territory of the Confederation. Fugitive slaves en masse entered the ranks of the Northern Army and in 1863 they even formed the 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment, whose combat path was depicted in the 1989 historical film Glory. In January 1865, just before the end of the war, which brought victory for the Northerners, the US Congress passed the 13th Amendment to the US Constitution prohibiting slavery. So the Underground Railroad finally became history. Since the 1990s, the legacy of a once-secret network of routes has been under jurisdiction of the US National Park Service. It organizes an annual thematic conference, recreates memorable places and routes, and popularizes the stories of people connected to it. And what about the bill with the portrait of Harriet Tubman? Yes, Trump, suspected of racism, stopped the process of its introduction. But in 2021, the administration of US President Joe Biden announced that it would reconsider this decision. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel to enjoy new episodes of How It Was.